Okay, on with another chess-based challenge. Um, this one, I was, again, quite pleased to produce a one-line solution, um, despite the challenge itself being somewhat complex. Um, so the challenge is, you are presented with a single knight on a chessboard, and your task is to count the number of unique positions that knight could reach using exactly two moves. So if you're not familiar with chess, this is a knight and it moves in a kind of L shape. So that's two squares in one direction and then one square in another direction. Um, so yeah, kind of an L shaped move. And I suppose if you're thinking about how you'd approach this problem, the first thing that might come to mind is some kind of depth or breadth first search where you're going to iterate the potential places that the knights could go to uh, after two hops. Um, that would be a logical way to attempt the problem. And of course, that's not what I'm going to do at all. So we'll see what I did do. Right, quickly scanning through a few solutions then. Um, yeah lots of code this one is not too big in fact this is very similar in concept to what i've done uh, albeit much much longer um, but much more readable actually so i'm not criticizing it at all um, but going down you can see my solution here this little one-liner and looks complicated at first but it's not really that complicated little bit of maths in there um, but yeah let's get diving straight into what I did to solve this problem so the first thing I started to think about was that having a knight on an 8x8 chessboard is an annoying constraint that makes it quite hard to think about so to simplify the problem i tried to imagine what it would be like on an infinite chessboard so if you had a knight just in an infinite plane of uh, squares how many places could it go to now of course that would be a fixed number always it would be a fixed number of potential places that the knight could go after two moves no matter where the knight was on the infinite chessboard so i thought hey i wonder what that looks like um so here we've got a knight and we've got blue knights representing the first hop that the knight could go to so if we start with this one we can just map out all of the positions so i've done this in advance and you can see that after two hops each of these black knights and including this red knight uh because you could go back to your own original square would be um the positions you could get after two moves and if we just go through all these tabs you can see it gradually builds up a nice little pattern of the potential places that you could go now of course this is only the black ones that count because these intermediate blue ones uh, you can actually get to those after two moves um, so we need those to be removed Ta-da! and these are the positions you could get to on an infinite chessboard. Okay, now armed with that knowledge, what can we now do? I'm just gonna zoom out a minute. And now in Excel here, I can just select a range, a conveniently sized eight by eight range and look down here and count the number of knights that happen to be selected now this is quite a handy way for me to see the potential number of places that the knight could go if the starting position was in the top left corner and i can just move the board by selecting different squares and you can see that if the knight was positioned here on the second square from the top left corner, the count would be 13. And in this way, I can just 
have a little look at how things tend to pan out. So this is 15, moving over again, we've got 17. So if you selected a whole bunch, um, again, making sure it's eight by eight, here we've got 27. Now, when playing around with this, I observed patterns and it occurred to me that there are only 10 permutations or there are only 10 unique night locations. When you take into account flips and rotations of the board, this is the key triangle. These are the unique locations of nights because anywhere else on this board is translatable to one of these squares in this triangle. So if you had this one, you could flip it and well, if you flipped it along the horizontal axis, then it would end up here and then you'd have to flip it diagonally and it would actually correspond to this square within this triangle. So we can now just use this to find out all of the answers uh, to all of those 10 possible scenarios, uh, which is exactly what I did. Um, and one thing to note is there is one exception to the way that I'm selecting here. Um, so in this specific corner case, the knight cannot actually reach this square. This is the only exception because this, in this situation, you would have to hop off the board and then back onto it in order to reach this square. I did lots of messing around, uh, as you can see on this sheet, but really this is the key thing in this top left-hand corner. Um, this square became my little cheat, sh cheat sheet. Um, because here's the triangle that I mentioned earlier. All right, it's in a different orientation. Um, but the problem became figuring out where the knight is in this triangle based on the array that's provided. Um, mapping it to these X and Y coordinates and then mapping those coordinates to the answers. Of course, the input that we get is a two-dimensional array uh, of arrays. Um, and what I'm doing here is quite concise and a bit weird, in fact. Um, what I'm doing is I'm implicitly converting the array to a string. Um, if I just console log this, We'll see what that comes out as. It comes out as a comma separated uh, list of the values in that array, which kind of neatly handles the nesting of all of the um, arrays. And once it's a string, I just get the index of the K. Um, so that will tell us the position in the string that the K is at. So looking at this test case here, you can see the K is here, 8, 16, 24, 32, 33, 34. So this is with a zero based array, index 34. And when we get the index of K and divide by two, because we have commas in there as well. So the division by two gets rid of the double counting of the characters. If I now do console log of S, you see here that we get the value 34, which represents its position if you considered all of these as a single string of characters. So to get the X coordinate, we simply do S, which is 34 uh, in this particular case, modulo eight. So modulo is an operator that gives you the remainder after you've divided by the divisor. So um, four multiplied by eight is 32. Um, and the remainder therefore is two. And you can see that this is zero, one, two in the x axis so that's quite a handy little way for us to get the x coordinate now for the y coordinate um quite straightforward as well so we simply divide by eight 
So 34 divided by 8 is going to be some kind of 4.25, actually, I think, exactly. Um, 4.25. So 4 is going to be the correct Y coordinate. It's no coincidence that you've got 1, 2, 3, 4 rows of 8. Um, and then we, yeah, this is the, the fourth, assuming we start with 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, we don't want the remainder, um, the decimal uh, of 0.25. Um, so this is just a shorthand way of doing a math.floor. Um, so we're just stripping off that uh, decimal point. Now we need to convert our x and y coordinates, which are between 0 and 7, um, to these 0 to 3 values. Now, in my crazy workings out, I've got a little diagram over here, um, which is showing essentially what we want to achieve. If it's 0, 1, 2, 3, we want to just keep it as 0, 1, 2, 3, because that's logical. Um, but if it was 4, 5, 6, 7, we could imagine that the triangle was flipped and the 4 position would be 3, the 5 position would be 2, 6 position would be 1, and 7 would be 0. And similarly, in the y-axis, we would just do the same thing. So we essentially need a function that's going to take 0 through 7 and just map it to 0, 1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1, 0. And that's what this map is doing. Um, so pretty simple. If it's less than 4, then we just keep the value of n. If it's more than 4, or 4, at, at least 4, then we do 7 minus n. So 7 minus 4 gives us 3. Let's just go back to this. Yeah, 7 minus 4 gives us 3. 7 minus 5 gives us 2. 7 minus 6 gives us 1. And 7 minus 7, of course, gives us 0. So this little section here quite neatly maps our x and y coordinates to the 0 to 3 range that we're looking for. Now, as you can see here, we can't allow all of the possibilities of the 0 to 3 range combinations um, in both x and y. We're only allowed to constrain it to this triangle here. Um, so that is in fact why we've got this sort, um, this little sort co uh, method here that we're calling. So I'm ensuring that we are always in what, a, a specific triangle because basically we're saying that the y value is always going to be greater than the x value or it's going to be greater than or equal to the x value and we're never going to be in a situation where the x value is greater than the y value finally the thing we need to do is to return the correct answer um, and you'll see that here we've got uh, an array of arrays which corresponds with our triangle actually so if i just flip back to here in fact, this is a better example because the triangle's just oriented slightly differently. I've got a, a row of four items, then three items, two items, one item, which contains the answers, and they correspond to the rows in this array here. And we use the Y coordinate to select which row we're going to choose. And then the X coordinate chooses the position in those sub array items. Now, of course, in this orientation, you this is offset. So technically, I'd have to have padding in my arrays uh, in here, but I wanted it to be nice and concise. So I've adjusted for the position in the array by deducting the value of x. Uh, just to kind of nudge things over for each row in the y direction that you go so that just means i don't have to add that padding to these arrays and it can be even uh, made even shorter and the final thing to do of course is to put it all on one line and submit the solution 
So please like and subscribe um, and I will create more stuff as soon as possible.